Good afternoon, everyone. I feel like I'm really starting to hit my stride with the uh, gavel. So just in time to turn it over to Stephen Hammers here in a few months. Uh, welcome to the March 1st meeting of the Rotary Club of Brentwood. My name is Drew Rogers. I have the privilege of serving as the president of our club this year. Yeah, thank you. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. I, there was a groundswell that Curry started. And I just didn't want, I wanted to give that the opportunity to play itself out. So thank you, Michael. Um, Welcome all of our members and guests and visitors today. Um, I will ask uh, Kip Dodson to join me at the podium to deliver our invocation, followed by Lynn McGill, who will deliver the pledge and four-way test. Kip. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here today, we stand humbly before you, acknowledging your presence, your eternal presence. In the heart of Brentwood, we reflect on the tapestry of our experiences, talents, leadership, and aspirations that your grace has woven, binding us together in unity. With 50 years of rich history, our club stands as a living testament to our enduring power of community, service above self, and fellowship inspired by your love. Each member, a cherished thread, contributes to the fabric the vibrant fabric of our community. Let unity guide our discussions, purpose guide our actions, and may each teaching, may your teachings resonate our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me. Excuse me. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Now the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. First, is, is it the fruit? Second, is it fair all? Third, we'll build the will and better friendships. Fourth, will be beneficial Kip, thank you very much. And Lynn, thank you for the pledge and four-way test. Uh, I will now ask Jennifer Bourne, club secretary, to introduce our guests and any visiting Rotarians. Jennifer. All right, we've got quite a few guests here today. We're going to start on this side of the room with Bob. If you haven't met him, he's been here a few times before. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm enjoying all of your meal hospitality. And uh, if I can string this along, I could I could eat for free on Fridays. <laughs> Thank you very much for your hospitality. Thank you, Bob. All right, I'm coming over here to Kip. Okay, I'm super proud to reintroduce Mark Lobliner, who's uh, in the process of being initiated as a new member. Let's go, Mark. Thank you. Mark? And then stand up, Matt. I am, this is my twin brother. No, that's not, 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 not kidding. I'm kidding. So uniquely, Matt and I grew up together in the same subdivision in Chagrin Falls, Ohio. Uh, I learned to play soccer, baseball, you know, at um, in infant ages in his yard. And he happened to move to uh, Nashville recently. And uh, he is a uh, entertainment lawyer, entertainment and film and tv lawyer so you'll make people rich and famous okay perfect. <laughs> welcome to our club welcome back all right and our the, our last guest is a prospective member so we've got we're listening mark and now brian over here um, hello everyone thank you for welcoming me to the group uh, thank you for the delicious food i'm looking forward to becoming a member Welcome, Brian. Hey, thank you, guys. If you haven't had a chance to meet our two prospects, please say hello. Wonderful. Jennifer, thank you very much. And Bob, Mark, Matt, Brian, welcome. We're glad that you are here. Uh, we have a wonderful program uh, for you today, and I um, look forward to hearing it myself. Um, we do have a few announcements uh, before I'll ask Bob Thompson to uh, start Happy Bucks. Uh, remember that Casino Night is March 23rd 
going to be at Andrews Jaguar Land Rover. Um, this is going to be a joint meeting with our friends from the Morning Club. Uh, there is information that is posted on the website. So if you go to the event, um, you can see the details. I believe it begins at 6.30 p.m. Um, there is an RSVP. It is $30 a person uh, to attend. And it is, again, bring your own beverage um, because that would require an enhanced level of insurance and cost and things that we don't want to incur um, and then ultimately pass on to you. So uh, please sign up. It'll be a great event. We're going to be doing it with our friends for the Morning Club and uh, hope to see you all there on March 23rd. Uh, remember that the Paul Harris Fellow matching program is still available. If you have any interest in that, I do have details with me today. Uh, but if you're interested in making yourself a Paul Harris Fellow or making someone else a Paul Harris Fellow, uh, the district has matching points that they can um, offer you. Uh, RILA applications are due April 1st. Sheila was not available to be with us last week. Uh, but she is here this week. And so if you have a candidate that's a rising sophomore or junior that you think would be a good candidate for the Rotary Youth Leadership Academy this summer, please see Sheila and get her an application for that person. The club does sponsor those. So that's a really good deal. Um, I would like to ask Julie Porter to come to the podium to make an announcement about Pancake Day that is coming up uh, on April 20th at Brentwood High School, which will be a the, for the first time ever, a joint event with Cars for Kids in the Tennessee Baptist Children's Home. So, Julie. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, uh, my name is Julie Porter, and it is pancake time again. Um, so, if you will see on your table, there's a sign-up sheet uh, to sign up for the different shifts that are available. We are still trying to work on getting an electronic um link sent out so you can do it online uh, i know sarah johnson and Susie Lindsay are working on uh trying to get that set up so hopefully we'll you'll see that in your emails uh this next week um but if you prefer <clears throat> there's a sign up sheet on your tables the date is all uh, april 20th so please everyone mark their calendars set up as the uh, evening before they, it's um all at brentwood high school and we are partnering with the Tennessee Baptist Children's Home um, for the car show. So hopefully this event's going to be a little larger than what it was this past year. That's that's our hope. So, But if you have any questions or concerns, you can either email myself or Jordan or Sarah Johnson. Do you have any questions? How many years has it been going on? Oh. 41st. Um. What'd you say, Mike? 41. 41 years. That'd be exciting. Well, I think a lot of this is just kind of a, a neighborhood. Um, I mean, I think it's looked forward to every year. So anyway, any other questions? All right. I'm excited. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Julie. Watch this. Um, I haven't had a chance to give this away, but today seems like a really good day. Somebody left this like a month and a half ago, and every day that I tried to give it away, it was a it was a sunny day. And so everybody's like, no, nah, that's not my umbrella. Well, today is a different day. So if you left an umbrella at the Martin Center a couple months ago, chances are this is yours. Come get it if you need one. Alan, I don't believe you if it's yours. If you say it's here. Um, okay, breaking news uh, that I want to share with you all. Major grant applications. So those that have an interest in applying for a major grant from the Brentwood Rotary Club Charitable Foundation, those major grant applications are due next Friday. Um, so we need to make sure that if, if you don't have one and you would like to get an application, that we get one to you so that we can get that grant application submitted. For those that are on online, that would be you turn those into Donna, John Helm, Donna Weeks, John Helm, or Tom Carr again by Friday, March 8th. I haven't seen it. Okay. 
So we need applications. We need applications for major grants next Friday, March 8th. You submit them to Donna Weeks, John Helm, Tom Carr. Fair enough? Very good. 10, yes, a major grant is a $10,000 grant. So that's meaningful. And and then and what I think we, we, we really want to do is as we go move forward towards the golf tournament, we, we would like to make sure that we're sharing who the golf tournament, the proceeds of the golf tournament is supporting through our major grants. So get your applications in. It is very, very important. And it's a meaningful amount of money. Um, there will be a, a brief meeting of the board of directors of our club in the front left room as you enter the room on the left um, immediately following this meeting. So with that, Bob Thompson, happy bucks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's all. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know that your offspring were capable of having males. I know that you have a lot of daughters. So congratulations on a grandson. Somebody started this custom a few years ago. I don't think I can afford to stay married much longer. This is $59 for 59 years. They've wow. Offered up. Congratulations. Deference to you, Mike. Uh, we should change the date. <laughs> Amen. I'm uh, throwing in five bucks. Uh, well, our meeting last week, uh, I was invited to join the governor's committee to coordinate human trafficking activities across the state. It includes all the law enforcement agencies and all the counties, uh, nonprofits, as well as TBI, which is the uh, the lead agency. So, so give me an opportunity to do a lot more work. In the, uh, area of human trafficking. So very happy about that. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Tom Carr tried to dump water on Jeff's lap. That's we're having a party here. <laughs> I just want to say how incredibly warm and welcoming to each other this club is. Um y'all support each other's stuff. You support my stuff. I, I'm I'm just overwhelmed this week. Um, I, my daughter's musical was started the, last night at the high school and Steve Tate was there. I don't know. You're going later. People have told me that they're coming because they care. And I, I just love how this club cares for each other. So I'm just really happy about that. Anyone else? Bob, great job. You collect a lot of money. Well done. Um, thank you, Bob, for that. And uh, moving forward, I would like to ask Bert Bradford to come to the podium to introduce our speaker, Kelly McGill. Bert. Thank you, sir. Uh, back in December, I just happened to be catch a newscast on Channel 4 one Friday night, and it was a story on this lady who's doing a documentary on World War II prep for D-Day 
Middle Tennessee, and she stated there were over 850,000 men training in Middle Tennessee during this time in the rural areas. And I thought, man, this is pretty cool. I love World War II stuff. So I decided to reach out to her, and she was happy to come. Her name is Kelly McGill, and she's founder and president of KGV Studios, one of the more successful respected video production companies in Nashville. Uh, she started the company with only herself and now has, 15 years later, has grown to eight full-time employees and a host of freelance people. She has over 45 clients that she's currently producing over 30 hours of production film for. Uh, prior to that, Kelly um, founded Nashville Interior Magazine, and this publication lasted through two recessions, never having a losing year. She sold it in 2016, and it's still in the works today. Uh, prior to that, she was a bookstore owner, a cafe, and a wine bar owner in Scottsdale, Arizona. She's also a member of the Pathway Leading Lending uh, she's a graduate of Vanderbilt University with a BA in Medieval English Literature. Uh, she has a grown son. She's an avid reader, skier, and golfer. Would you welcome, let's listen to Kelly McGill. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to be here today and speak to all of you. And I see some familiar faces, uh, not least of which is Curry Andrews. And he has a habit of wanting to introduce me as a lady who owns a cleaning service. So uh, that's not the case. But if you want to keep introducing me like that, I might start another business. <laughs> if you'll do my business, Dev. Um, so uh, uh, one other thing, you know, the Rotary is actually part of this story, which a lot of people don't realize. But in uh, 1939 or so, Governor Cooper at the time, Representative Jim Cooper's father, uh, was governor of the state. And he went to Germany on a rotary trip. And he supposedly met Hitler or was in you know, a presentation with Hitler. And he saw everything that Germany was doing to, to put themselves on a war footing. He came back to the state of Tennessee and said, we're gonna be at war. And in order to you know, get as much income into the state, he worked with Senator McKellar and Secretary of State Cordell Hull to make Tennessee available for a lot of military training. And after the Great Depression, it brought a lot of income into the state and changed lives forever. So um, this, is a, this is a PDF. I'm gonna walk you through the PDF. Can everybody see it? Am I in anybody's way? Okay. So uh, maneuvers took place in the state of Tennessee from 1941 to 1944. Let's go to the next one. Um, I realized in 2017 that nobody had interviewed any of the civilians about this story. And when you listen to oral histories from soldiers, World War II veterans that are at the Library of Congress or World War II Museum, nobody talks about maneuvers. If they did maneuver, they would say, we maneuvered and then we deployed. And the interviewers never asked the question, what are maneuvers? What are they like? So next one. In the 80s, my grandmother, I'm, I'm in the middle there with my grandmother in the 80s. She wrote her memoirs. And one of our family farms was in the middle of maneuver area. And that was owned by my great grandfather. You see the picture in the lower left. That's my great grandfather. And it was his farm that the maneuvers happened on. The two pictures at the top uh, and upper right, my grandparents are in an army Jeep on the farm and upper left is a tiny little uh, store in Grant, Tennessee, which is just east of Lebanon, which is where our family was from, covered with maneuver soldiers. Bottom right hand corner is myself and my son interviewing a woman um, in 2023, Faith Nolner. So um, I've started interviewing as many people as possible Every soldier I've interviewed, except for one, has died. He's now 102. Um, I've interviewed 107 people at this point. Um, about 25% of the civilians I interviewed have died. So we've legitimately got the tail end of this story. And now I've compiled the largest body of firsthand accounts that exist for maneuvers. Next one. 
everybody's forgotten that at the beginning of World War II, we basically had no army. We Our army was the 17th largest in the world. Romania had a bigger army than we had. We were in no way the superpower that we became. And so we had to build an army. We had to build all of this equipment because the technology has completely changed. World War I, you're in trenches. World War II, you've got the combustion engine and you're on the move. It is a mobile warfare. Everything has changed. And this is why Hitler is so lethal and so effective when he starts invading other countries. We had to do all of that, plus initiate a draft to build a civilian army. But just as um, General Douglas MacArthur said, the secrets of our weaknesses are secrets only to our own people. The whole world knew that we weren't in position. We just weren't aware of it. Go ahead. Tennessee was chosen for the partly for the topography with the rolling hills and the rivers. There were going to be a lot of river crossings that we needed to practice because once we got to France and Germany, that's what we were going to be trying to wage war over that sorts of terrain. Um, California was also used, uh, Louisiana, the Carolinas, but Tennessee was one of the largest states. And we were one of the only states where that maneuver training happened on private property in 21 counties. So this map, everything that's colored in the middle, it should be blue, but it looks green. Um, those are all maneuver counties. And so 850,000 soldiers maneuvered in millions of acres in middle Tennessee. Everything in a orange dot is a POW camp. Anything that's a black dot is a tragedy that we're gonna be fo following. The yellow dot right in the middle of all that green is Cumberland University, which was the headquarters for maneuvers. And uh, the other ones are different types of training bases. So this is a statewide activity that's happening. So everyone in the country is having their sons drafted. They are enduring rationing. They're buying war bonds. It's very disruptive. But only in places like Tennessee, where there are maneuvers, are you also living in the middle of a war zone that is dangerous where civilians are killed, where children are killed on their family farms by all of this maneuver activity. So we really did sacrifice a lot more than people who didn't live in a, in a maneuver area. In 1942, two African-American tank battalions came through Tennessee, uh, the 758th and the 761st, including Jackie Robinson. So he trained in middle Tennessee as well. We're going to talk about that a little bit in the documentary. So syphilis and VD, it's always a problem, especially when you have military. And uh, at the time, people have generally forgotten that women could be arrested for a morals violation. Morals violation could be that you're having dinner by yourself. That's enough to get you arrested and taken to jail. And there was a federal law that was passed called the May Act that made it a federal crime to prostitute within a certain uh, vicinity of a military encampment if it was enacted. It was only enacted in two places, Tennessee and North Carolina. And when I interviewed the senior historian for the World War II Museum, and I said, let's talk about the May Act. He said, I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. But it affected thousands of women, and it's a completely untold story about what women were subjected to that wasn't right. That's going to be a small part of the story. It's a little bit bigger in the trailer, just so people can understand it. But we're going to cover that as well. Japanese American, German Americans, Italian Americans who weren't trusted to fight for one reason or another were put on cleanup crews. They were put in, into service somehow that wasn't in combat. And so the 1800th engineers came through Tennessee in 1944 and they put everything back together, the damaged roads and bridges and farms and fences. They did all of that work and all the photographs that you see are taken from Tennessee or at least on the, the Japanese part. German POW, POW camps were all across the United States and Tennessee had 11 of those POW camps. Those Germans uh, would go out onto farms and they would work. So we ended up integrating, becoming friends with them. I interviewed a German POW who was captured in Tunisia and he was a POW in Crossville from 1943 until almost 1946. He's not in the trailer, but that's a small part of this documentary as well. A lot of people have also forgotten that country music was launched in part by World War II. 
you have all of these soldiers coming down from the north. Most of the training bases are in the south, mainly due to weather. WSM can be heard at these training bases. The Camel Caravan starts this little tour, and they're going around and doing uh, uh, shows for the men in these bases. And when all these soldiers would come to Nashville and they would want to go do something at night, just like today, they go to the Grand Ole Opry. And all of those things combined so that before World War II, country music is really hillbilly, hillbilly music, and it's a regional phenomenon. Afterwards, you see country music take off as a national art form. We've got four tragedies that we're going to follow to sort of humanize the fact that these were very serious, even though they weren't in combat. These people still died, and they died in service of World War II so that we could learn lessons so fewer people would die when we actually went into combat going to break down into three one-hour episodes. So far, we have national distribution on PBS in May of 2025, which is the 80th anniversary of VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. But we're looking for other streaming services as well. We're going to make a final decision on that pretty soon. But we also have interest uh, from Tom Hanks in being our narrator. And I don't know Tom Hanks, so that should tell you the interest that this story is getting even outside of Tennessee. Uh, right now, where we're at with this project is we're in production, but we're also still fundraising to meet our goals. We have a large budget, it's a $3.7 million budget. And so I'm working hard to sort of build the plane while we're flying it. And all of that is being driven by really wanting to come out in May of 2025. If we can do that, a lot of the national news agencies and morning shows are going to need something to celebrate the 80th anniversary of VE Day. And this is a perfect project to highlight that. So that's kind of where we're under pressure to make this all happen at once. So I have a an extended trailer that I want to show you. It's about 12 minutes long, and it covers everything that we're going to be talking about pretty much in the documentary. You'll see our interviews, some of the footage that we found. We haven't yet digitized the photos that we found. Some of them are watermarked. But listen also for the radio broadcasts. WSM had this unique ability to go out into the field and broadcast from the field that most radio stations didn't have. It's all pretty much done in studios. I was able to find three of those recordings in Washington, D.C. and corresponding photos that go with them in Nashville so that we have some incredible assets that we're going to be able to use to tell the story. Let's do that one next. Never before has our American civilization been in such danger as now, danger against which we must prepare. The Axis powers must not win this war. We are on the verge of war for which we are as prepared, a war which cannot be won against armies stronger than our own. At the beginning, there is no way we could have defeated the armies of the Axis powers. Hitler had 136 divisions in the German army, while the United States had five. If we had shared the border with Germany, they would have done the same thing to us as they did to Poland. In those early days, we had a lot of trouble with training in the United States. We were short of machine guns. We had just a very few. We just had to uh, play like we did have them. And the, the tanks were the same thing. We had the old style tanks and not enough of them. And we would have to paint on the side of the truck tank. We were not prepared for anything. This would not be a static war like World War I. We needed to learn the skills of moving massive amounts of men and equipment quickly. There were maneuvers all over the eastern half of the United States. There's the famous Louisiana maneuvers. There's maneuvers in Arkansas, Carolines, and Tennessee. It wasn't a perfect duplicate for the European countryside, but it was pretty darn close. Advance. America's army steps ahead in the new lessons of defense. If they were going to fail, they need to fail in training, not in combat. You're soon fine when you're out in the field that what looks like doctrine on a piece of paper can be a, a, a mess when it's actually put into action. We really didn't know what the hell they were doing. <laughs> and they didn't either. You had to learn from what these guys told you, and a lot of what they told you was not the right thing. So you were constantly changing 
your method of how you did something. Nobody seemed to know what the hell they were doing. You could hardly keep the parachute from blowing you out of the sky. They were usually sent right out after they'd had minimum basic training. There was a black regiment, and that was significant to me. They were all good soldiers, as you would expect. At the time, African-American soldiers were relegated to the kitchen, the post office, the quartermaster's department. But the maneuvers gave these African-American soldiers the first chance to prove that they were just as good as the white soldiers. You couldn't ignore it when, you know, bombers were flying overhead or smaller aircraft or tanks were coming through your town. Well, then I heard this rumbling sound and uh, we stood there waiting and the rumbling got louder and louder and then this convoy started through. We stood there until we were wore out and the convoy was still coming through. It is a terribly strained impact. 60,000 bombing over villages and towns that are listed as possessing populations of 300, 1,500. They were camped out everywhere. There were one set of huts, huge numbers of tents, and the, the tanks were coming and going, the jeeps everywhere. It was very hard to do any farm work, and there's nothing like having an anti-aircraft gun at each corner of your house. <laughs> this was not a wealthy part of the United States. Many soldiers were absolutely shocked at the conditions of some of these folk in, in rural Tennessee. They would give us anything, but they didn't have much. I see the little children, they're three little children, you know, and then you see these old folks. I thought we're grandparents. They were their parents, and apparently their lives are so difficult that they wore them out, you know. This broadcast is emanated through the facilities of WSM in Asheville, Tennessee. You've got bombers and tanks and thousands of troops in full war games. What a story. It's Radio Gold. Shelbyville, Middle Tennessee. We are now ready for the first blackout of the defense test of America. They have sighted those bombers, but they're now firing at them. The WSM radio service wanted to be there. They participated in the maneuvers by sending its correspondents out into the field. As the Jack Harris speaking from the edge of the swirling waters of the Cumberland River, at a spot in the Tennessee maneuver area, which has become the most vital debate of these deadly, serious mock war games. There were going to be injury, sometimes even death, not only among the soldiers, but among the civilian population. We were sitting out in chairs and and cooling our heels from working in the fields that day. And all of a sudden, we heard this crash of the two planes run together. It was a terrible explosion. And fire and smoke you could see way up in the sky and knew there was no hope for no survivors. It was a cost that the nation had to pay in order to improve our military forces, and we stoically endured it. When I first went in the service, they uh, said, fellas, I got to show this movie to you. We were showing a film on the VVs and so forth and so on. Several venereal diseases, but the most common two are syphilis and gonorrhea. And you catch it only one way from a woman. What the hell? I never heard of anything like this in my whole life. Everyone knows about Rosie the Riveter, but there's another wartime feminine icon, the shady lady or the wartime prostitute. Women and girls are sent out according to carefully laid plans where they spread venereal disease and disorder among those upon whom the defense of the nation depends. To control the spread of VD, the May Act was passed making solicitation in and around a military base a federal crime. It is the community's job to guard them from those dangerous diseases, syphilis and gonorrhea, and to combat prostitution and promiscuity, spreaders of these infections. Women's civil rights were stripped away. They were fined, imprisoned, and put into isolation hospitals. Yet there was no punishment for soldiers who had purchased these services. Well, they weren't condemned if they had a venereal disease or something like that. They were sent for treatment. Don't be afraid and don't be ashamed. You won't be punished. 
No loss of pay, no loss of rank. All the army wants to do is cure you. The African-American soldiers had unequal treatment. If a black soldier in uniform was walking down the street with an African-American woman, an EMT would stop them and ask to see the woman's health card. Of course, the implication was this was a prostitute. These African-American women stopped dating African-American soldiers. That experience of sort of cross-cultural pollination between Americans from different sectors wasn't always pretty at the time. I can remember the Japanese troops marching down West Main Street. That was really a startling thing for us to see at that time. Of course, the war was with Japan, uh, and lots of the Japanese on the West Coast were interned. The contradiction there that you know, a lot of the country, and yet your family is mistreated, had us angry, you might say. There was an engineer battalion that was made up of Japanese Americans, German Americans, Italian Americans. That was the 1800 engineers. Their job was to go out and fix these fences, go out and patch roads, go out and do all the repair work. We never did speak to the farmers. They just did the work around their farm. Servicemen, the traveling camel caravans are still on the move. Twelve more camps are on this week's schedule. Nashville and WSM would be at the core of this confluence of human beings and young soldiers who began to participate in the maneuvers just nearby. They created a little traveling review that was specifically designed to go to the many military barracks and stations and bases in this area. And to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana, and 15 of the training centers by armed forces during the following week go the three traveling units of the Camel Caravan, giving free shows for the men. To all of you, we send our greetings and hope that you enjoy the show. They hit every base from Pennsylvania to Georgia and across the Carolinas and put on shows for tens of thousands of soldiers. The barracks needed that morale booster. And the Grand Ole Opry was being played in all of the military bases in the whole region. So whether people like or know country music or not, they're hearing it. Million men for defense and everyone a trained soldier, learning the tricks of their trade by practice and not from books. <laughs> you have a much more experienced force marching off if it's been through these kinds of large scale maneuvers. Because the Army was able to test these type of maneuvers along with the new equipment they were receiving here in Tennessee and in the other maneuver areas, they were able to perfect the tactics. The American Army through these tactics saved lives. In maneuvers down in Tennessee, my radio went out. So we had developed a sort of hand signals. Uh, after we got that worked and we got it going perfect, we never used it again until we hit the Ziegfried line. Made General Patton happy. Colonel Wooden was our battalion commander. The ironic thing about it, he landed in an SS location on Lewis where he landed in an SS location in Normandy, same thing. When they tied him up on maneuvers, they murdered him at the wall. You can read account after account of the men who took part in these maneuvers. And they all say it was a life-changing experience. There's a tremendous concentration of effort. And it was not without its cost. But we were on our way to creating a superior military force that would win once we got to Central Europe. Yeah, thank you. So um, we've got 10 minutes, so I'm not going to play the other little video. I'm going to open it up for questions and uh, answer whatever I can answer.
Hi, my name is George Barrett, and um, I have a feeling that you probably did a lot of research using my father's library. Something called Universal Newsreel existed from 1933 to 1966. And my father was the film librarian for Universal Newsreel. I was wondering, uh, and in 1966, when they closed up their shop in New York, his entire library was transferred to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. And I'm wondering, have you done any of your research using that facility? That is the main facility that I've used. It's in College Park. It's it's the one in College Park. And that is what's called the morgue for the Army Signal Corps. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I began. But it's also the morgue for Universal Newsreels. And Universal Newsreels have been fabulous. The problem with Universal Newsreels is that sometime in the 70s or 80s, there was a warehouse fire and many of the films were destroyed. So now the way you have to research Universal Newsreels is to get this binder and each episode of the universal newsreel is in a plastic sleeve. You look at it and it's a, it's broken down. It's a, it's a description of everything on that newsreel. It's broken down into stories and there's either a no or a yes next to that story as to whether it exists. So it's very hard to now research mm. universal newsreels because of that fire, but yes. Thank you. Have you spent much time at the Sam Warner Museum in Mont Eagle? Yes. Um, Parker Lowndes at Sam Warner Military Museum is a wonderful supporter of the project. We've done some filming of interviews down there. He has got everything under the sun in terms of World War II. He's got tractors. He's got field mess kits. He's got plates. He's got radio. He's got field desks. He's got everything. And so... When we go to film some of the dramatizations, we're not going to have actors speaking lines or anything, but some of the things we're going to be talking about, we don't have any sort of footage or photos from the time to illustrate it. And so we're going to have to shoot some things. And um, Sam Warner Military Museum has graciously said that they would donate use of those items to us. But they're, these, these are great suggestions so far. You guys are nailing it. Hi, in my corporate career, I worked at Oak Ridge. And a fun fact about it was basically it was nothing in 1939. There was this letter written by Einstein to FDR. And then four years later, there were 25,000 people working on something that only like eight people knew what it was about. I was just curious, what was the, what, how were the maneuvers related to Oak Ridge? Because it's only like two hours, a little bit down the road. There's no real relation between maneuvers and Oak Ridge other than proximity. And there's no real relation between German POWs and maneuvers other than proximity. Um, and so we may or may not put the German POW stuff in. We might do a separate video, you know, on that. Um, but it is kind of fascinating when you think that you've got this highly secret, you know, research and work being conducted at Oak Ridge. And then in Crossville, which is even closer than maneuvers, you have a POW camp that's made up of all officers, German officers. You go a little bit further to the west, and now you hit maneuvers. You go south, you're in Tullahoma, which is Camp Forest at the time, Arnold Air Force Base. You go a little bit north, and you're in Clarksville, where you've got Camp Campbell. And you go to you know Paris, Tennessee, and you've got Camp Tyson, which is the only barrage balloon training facility or yeah, in the United States, the only one. So there was a huge amount of activity happening just on the outskirts of Oak Ridge, which I think makes it so, somewhat different than Los Alamos. Um, so I was born and raised here in Middle Tennessee and had no idea any of this went on. Um, do these farms have historical markers on them that you know represent what happened at these farms? Um, and if not, is there talk that these could be coming in the future. It is literally tens of thousands of farms because most of the farms at the time are small farms, right? It's it's dozens of acres or a few hundred acres for the most part. So you're talking tens of thousands of farms. There are no markers that I know of yet. 
I think there are a few maneuver markers around the state that have been put up, but certain counties like Wilson County, Smith County, Sumner County are beginning self-guided driving tours for maneuvers, and they're raising the money now to get those markers up. And then in Carthage, uh, the first weekend of May every year, they have a maneuvers reenactment. So they have flyovers, they have military reenactors doing battles, they've got artif artifacts from the maneuvers uh, there, and that's been very popular as well. So what I'm hoping is that the documentary broadcast nationally is going to bring national attention to the fact that there actually is a World War II site other than Pearl Harbor that you can come to in the United States. And since most of the soldiers who trained here were from someplace else, all of their descendants are elsewhere. So it's a great tourism opportunity um, if we can get that message out. And then we've got military museums all across the, streets, the state. You've got Wings of Victory that's just about to open up at Fort Campbell. Our state museum has you know, information. The military museum is being remodeled right now. Um, so I think it's a, a great opportunity to have some synergy to say, hey, you can come to Tennessee not just for the mountains, not just for the whiskey, not just for the music. You can come for a civil war, or a war, not just for civil war. You can come for a World War II visit as well. Is there any printed material out there about the maneuvers, books, et cetera, that, uh, that you can get? There are a few. The Bible is written by a guy named Woody McMillan. And he wrote a book called In the Presence of Soldiers. It is extraordinarily well-researched and he goes into the actions and the problems that happened every week of every cycle. Um, but he has a lot of sort of ancillary stories as well. Um, you can only get that on eBay now or Amazon. If you can find one, it's generally a hundred bucks and Woody McMillan does not have any plans to put that in to reprint. And he should um, Gene Sloan, who was a reporter with the banner in the forties out of Lebanon he wrote a book called With Second Army Somewhere in Tennessee. You can find that one as well. It's much less comprehensive. It's it's a lot of his articles at the time that didn't make it through censors. Um, and then there's another woman, I can't remember her name, but she just came out with a small book called Combat Boots by the Door. But if you really want to understand maneuvers, it's Woody McMillan's book, In the Presence of Soldiers. You mentioned funding. What, uh, how are you going about that? So we are a 501c3. Um, and I've got all of our paperwork. If anybody would like to donate, I, I will gladly accept it. Um, we are talking to corporations, we are talking to foundations, and we are talking to individuals as well. And uh, we will take whatever size donation somebody is interested in giving, but we're still hoping to find a title sponsor, somebody who's going to give a significant chunk of that 2.5 million to $3.7 million budget, um, you know, to come in at like a $500,000 level. So if you can think of anybody or any corporation you think would be interested in being, you know, a partner at any level, I am, I will gladly take the, uh, take the name because this is something that, like I said, we're never going to be able to tell the story again from a firsthand account. So just as an American, I look at this and I say, I've got to do the best job I can with this because a hundred years from now when I am long gone and my children are long gone, this is still going to be there and it's still going to be part of American history. And I don't want to do this in a slapdash manner. Do you know why they would bring all those German prisoners all the way back to Tennessee? Yes, I do. So we have all of these troop carriers that are taking hundreds of thousands and millions of our troops to Europe and they're coming back empty. Um, you don't really want to try to house enemy combatants in a in 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 a battle zone because it's just too difficult, first of all. And if they get back, they can get back to their unit. We also knew that we had a labor shortage because all of our sons had been drafted and put into war. And so they brought all of these soldiers back. Well, actually the Italians and the Germans came here. The Japanese tended to go to Australia. And uh, if they were an officer, they could choose whether or not they wanted to go to work. But if they were enlisted, they had to go out to work and they were paid every day. I think it was 18 cents a day. They could spend that money in their PX on cigarettes or whatever they wanted to buy at the time. But they did a lot of logging. They did a lot of farm labor. They weren't allowed to do any kind of work that would help 
our war effort, but certainly in terms of agriculture, they were used and the farm families in the area found them to be extremely helpful. And they were actually quite glad to be in America and be treated really well as a POW, as opposed to still being in battle. And I know you've had your hand up and uh, aside from your organization, are there other organizations that are working to preserve this historical record? Not only just here in Tennessee, but elsewhere in the country. The only other person I know of who has done any of this work is a woman named Teresa Bush. And she is a communications coordinator for Smith County. And she's tied in with Jerry, Colonel Jeremy McFarland of the Lebanon Veterans Museum. And he's kind of who helped me begin this process as well. She has collected some interviews I don't have, but she, her purpose for her documentary is really for education. Mine was always for distribution on a larger platform like Netflix or PBS or something like that. So we decided early on, instead of working against each other, we would help each other since we had different audiences in mind. So as I found things I thought she's needed, I've called her and said, hey, do you want to come on one of my shoots? As she's found things that she thought I needed, she's come on my, or, you know, we, we've just gone on each other's shoots. We've shared information with each other um, in the hopes that between the two of us, we can preserve enough of this that it's not lost entirely. But I don't know anybody other than Teresa who's actually gone out and done the work. And at this point, I've filmed 107 people. So... And I, I don't know how many she's filmed, but I know it's not that many, not as many as us. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, if, do you have a minute to stick around and answer? So if you have anything that you wanted to discuss or questions of Kelly, please stick around and, um, and approach her. Thank you so much for being here. What an amazing program. And thank you for the work that you're doing to preserve this history for our state. Uh, we do have a gift that we'd like to give you. Um, and so we give to our speakers that come and join us, we give a gift that is a pen. Uh, it's got our name on it. Um, and it's a token that you can use to remember your time here. The first thing that we'd like to ask you to do with that pen would be to sign this book, which is a book that we read to elementary school students in the Brentwood community. And so if you'd put your name and a little, one of the reasons why you're here um, then we'll tell a story of, of who you are and why you were visiting us. So thank you so much, Kelly. Um, to our guests, thank you for being here today. Uh, Bob, Matt, Mark, Brian, welcome. Uh, we hope to see you again uh, very soon. Um, and if you can stick around and help uh, put away tables and chairs, please do. We're stacking uh, chairs in stacks of eight by the tables. And then the tables go back here into this closet. Uh, if you are on the board, then we are having a brief meeting at the room to the left um, immediately following this meeting. And if there is nothing else for the good of Rotary, then we are adjourned. And if you want, a, if you want an umbrella, here's an umbrella. <laughs>